Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. The outrageous ruling charging President Trump $355 million is not the end of the story. President Trump is already seeking a counter-judgment. New York is under pressure from so many different angles. Luckily, a law has been overturned. The law sought to let non-citizens vote in New York City, but that law has been found to be unconstitutional. Missouri is the next state to step up and help Texas. Missouri is deploying hundreds of troops to the border. European farmers are not giving up their fight against increased taxes, unfair gas prices, and not getting their fair share from their hard work. Indeed, no farmers, no food. And finally, James Biden testified in Congress about his business dealings, especially AmeriCorps, which is being investigated for $100 million in Medicare fraud. He also answered questions about where the money came from for the payments he made to Joe Biden, which were labeled loan repayments. Okay, let's get into it. On Wednesday, a New York appeals court ruled that a law allowing non-citizens to vote in local elections in New York City violates the state's constitution. Paul Wooten, the Associate Justice of the Appellate Division for the Second Judicial Department in New York ruled, we determined that this local law was enacted in violation of the New York State Constitution and Municipal Home Rule Law and thus must be declared null and void. This is regarding a bill that the New York City Council approved in 2021. Mayor Eric Adams' administration had defended the law and appealed a lower court's ruling against it. The law was intended to let green card holders and other people living in New York City with federal work authorization vote in local elections for offices including mayor and city council. This would have applied to some 800,000 new eligible voters in New York. However, the law could not go into effect. This is because it quickly faced a lawsuit and now it's been found unconstitutional. This scored a significant win for those who sued the law. This included Representative Nicole Maliotakis and New York City Council leader Joe Borelli. Maliotakis celebrated the news on X, stating, Great news, we won the appellate court and New York City mayor's attempt to implement the law to register non-citizens to vote in New York City elections has been struck down. This is a big victory in preserving both the integrity of our elections and the voice of American citizens. Borelli also noted that the case was straightforward. He said all they had to do was read the state constitution and municipal law. The criticism falls on the proponents of the bill. On Wednesday, President Trump's attorney confirmed that he seeks a counter-judgment in the civil fraud trial. Lawyer Clifford Robert submitted a letter in the New York City Civil Court to Judge Arthur Engren. He said that the ruling and ban on President Trump from doing business in the state for several years was unfair. Notably, Robert argued that President Trump was denied the chance to speak against the ruling before the judge filed it. The attorney noted, because the decision ordinarily entails more complicated relief, the instruction contemplates notice to the opponent so that both parties may either agree on a draft or prepare counter proposals to the settlement before the court. Robert explained that because President Trump was denied the ability to offer a counter proposal, the defendants therefore request that the court set a return date for their proposed judgment that affords defendants sufficient time to submit a proposed counter judgment. Robert asserted that it would be unfair and unjust if the judge did not allow the defendants to submit a counter judgment. Another state joined Texas to fight the rising border crisis. On February 20th, Missouri Governor Mike Parson announced that the state would deploy up to 200 National Guard soldiers and 22 state highway patrol troopers to support operations in Texas. This came following Governor Kristi Noem ordered to deploy the National Guard troops of South Dakota to Texas. Parson claimed that he witnessed a crisis that is directly fueling America's drug crisis. Parsons said about two weeks ago, I visited the southern border and let me not mince words when I say it is a crisis. He added that the Biden administration's border policy fueled the fentanyl crisis in Missouri. 
Parson noted, Missourians are dying. Families are being ripped apart. Communities are being destroyed. And Missouri children are falling victim. It all stems from the Biden administration's reckless, irresponsible, and failing open border policy. With our southern border wide open, every state is now a border state. According to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, the fentanyl epidemic is getting more dangerous in Missouri. The data released by the agency shows a sharp rise in the number of overdose deaths since 2016. The data points to 2,163 overdose deaths in Missouri in 2021. That's like six or seven people every day. That was up from 1,366 in 2017. Health officials reported that roughly 70% of these deaths were caused by synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Parson also sent a $2.3 million supplemental budget request to his state's legislature. The budget is to support border security efforts and to backfill the governor's office's emergency response fund. Besides these duties, the 22 troopers of the Missouri State Highway Patrol will assist other law enforcement agencies in traffic enforcement, crime prevention, and criminal interdiction. Missouri National Guard soldiers, which will start their tasks on March 10th, will also help construct physical barriers and security patrols. Before I move on, I want to take a moment to thank you all for your support of Front Page. Every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore from YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, let's get back into it. On February 21st, James Biden, Joe Biden's younger brother, gave closed door testimony to the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees. James Biden initially told his interviewers that he was not part of a business deal involving Hunter Biden and several of his associates. However, after investigators showed him an agreement that featured his signature alongside those of Hunter Biden and his business partners, James Biden then said that he did not remember signing the agreement. The deal in question was a proposed joint venture involving an entity known as Sinohawk and the Chinese Communist Party linked energy firm that is called CEFC China Energy Limited. 50% of Sinohawk was to be owned by Hudson West 4. This is an entity managed by Gong Wendong, who is an emissary for CEFC and who was known as Joe Biden's office mate. The other 50% of the company is owned by Anida Holdings LLC. Anida is an entity that is controlled by Hunter Biden, James Biden, Rob Walker, James Gilliar, and Tony Bobulinski. This is according to Bobulinski's February 13th testimony to congressional investigators and documents obtained by the Senate Judiciary Committee. James Biden also claimed that he threw out a diamond that Hunter Biden had given him to appraise. That diamond was given to Hunter Biden by CEFC Chairman Yu Jingming. This was presumably to convince Hunter Biden to do business with CEFC. Hunter apparently gave the diamond to James to appraise, but then allegedly James then instead threw it away. Yeah, right. That would be the second known diamond that Hunter Biden got from CEFC executives. Reportedly, Hunter received $10 million a year for three years and a diamond worth at least $80,000 in February of 2017. Yu Jingming worked with James Gilliar and Biden family associate Rob Walker to get connected to Hunter. Jin Ming strived to expand the company's influence worldwide. However, on July 30th, 2017, Hunter Biden sent a threatening WhatsApp text message to a Chinese business associate who was affiliated with CEFC. Let's recall the text. The text reads, I'm sitting here with my father and we'd like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. Tell the director that I'd like to resolve this now before it gets out of hand and now means tonight. And Z, if I get a call or text from anyone involved in this, other than you, Jong, or the chairman, 
I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to forever hold a grudge that you will regret not following my direction, I'm sitting here waiting for the call with my father. This text message was according to information that was disclosed to lawmakers by an IRS whistleblower. The records and other information that was obtained by Republican lawmakers also indicated that Hunter Biden and James Biden profited from a $5 million wire from a CEFC-linked firm in August of 2017. Those funds do not appear to have been transferred to Sinohawk or Tony Bobulinski, but instead to Hudson West 3. Hudson West 3 is another joint venture that was established by the Bidens and CEFC in August of 2017. Subsequently, wire transfers were conducted from Hudson West 3 to Owasco, Hunter Biden's firm, and to Lion Hall Group, James Biden's company. This appeared to have cut Sinohawk, or Tony Bobulinski, out of the deal altogether. Bobulinski told investigators on February 13th that the Biden family, Hunter and James, knowingly and aggressively defrauded him as the CEO of Sinohawk Holdings and as a member of Anida Holdings LLC at the end of July 2017. Bobulinski also said that the Biden family violated their fiduciary duties to Sinohawk and Anida as they enriched themselves at the CEFC trough. However, James Biden insisted to congressional investigators in his opening statement that Joe Biden had never benefited financially from his work with CEFC. He said that Joe did not know about his business dealings. The House Oversight and Judiciary Committee lawmakers pressed James specifically about a $200,000 payment that he made to Joe shortly after a lucrative business deal. The money had been marked loan repayment in the checks memo field. In 2017, James Biden was loaned $600,000 by a health care company that he is now accused of defrauding, AmeriCorps. The same day as $200,000 came in from the health care firm on March 1, 2017, James wrote a check to Joe for $200,000 that was labeled loan repayment. Shortly after another lucrative deal with CEFC, James wrote another check to Joe Biden. This time it was for $40,000 and it was also marked as loan repayment. As James describes the payments to investigators, he said, they were short-term loans that I received from Joe when he was a private citizen and I repaid them within weeks. He had no information at all about the source of the funds I used to repay him. The complete explanation is that Joe lent me money and I repaid him as soon as I had the funds to do so. However, surprisingly, bank records indicate that Joe sent money to James weeks before repayments were made. James said, I never asked my brother to take any official action on my behalf, my business associates or anyone else. James admitted that there was no documentation of the loans and Joe did not charge him any interest. But a political report this week revealed that James invoked his brother's name to the now bankrupt AmeriCorps on multiple occasions, and he even spoke of his plans to give Joe equity and install Joe on the board. Reportedly, James even offered to have Joe promote the company in a future presidential campaign. James also allegedly offered to secure funds from Middle Eastern investors in order to fund the expansion of AmeriCorps. The expected funds did not arrive, and this led to the downfall of the healthcare company, which left bills unpaid and patients untreated. The company also remains under investigation. It's accused of $100 million in Medicare fraud. At least three of Joe Biden's relatives were also employed by AmeriCorps, including James's wife, Sarah, and his son, Jamie. AmeriCorps imploded in 2019 and filed for bankruptcy amid lawsuits and a federal investigation into fraud allegations. AmeriCorps also accused James Biden of failing to repay the $600,000 in loans. Politico's investigation did not find that Joe Biden directly involved himself in the fraud. However, 
Joe Biden did benefit indirectly from his brother's work with the firm with the loan repayments. So what do you think? Do you think James and Hunter benefited from Joe being in office? The protests of farmers on tractors is continuing across Europe. On Wednesday, hundreds of farmers drove their tractors into central Madrid. Spanish farmers, like other European farmers, fight against the European Union and local farming policies. They demand measures to reduce production cost hikes. The protest was the biggest to occur in the Spanish capital after more than two weeks of daily protests across the country. It included a rally outside the Agricultural Ministry headquarters. Many of the tractors flew Spanish flags and many farmers carried banners reading, there is no life without farming and farmers in distinction. Sylvia Ruiz, a livestock farmer, said it's impossible to live from the rural industry, which is what we want, to live from our work. That's all we're asking for. Similar protests have occurred across the block in recent weeks. Farmers complain that the policies of the EU on the environment and other matters are a financial burden. They argue that the policies make their products more expensive than non-EU imports. In response, Spain and the European Commission, which is the executive arm of the EU, have made some adjustments in the recent weeks. However, farmers argue that they are insufficient. Spanish farmers argue that a law that ensures supermarkets and wholesalers pay their fair price for their goods has not been enforced. This is while consumer prices soar. The protests are also ongoing in France, which is the largest agricultural producer in the EU. French President Emmanuel Macron has been under intense pressure from angry farmers. Macron is expected to attend the major annual agricultural fair this weekend in Paris. On Wednesday, French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal tried to convince the agricultural sector. He said, in recent weeks across Europe, farmers have made themselves heard with a cry of anger, a cry that comes from deep down. Behind this cry is most of all a call for action. Atoll promised to draft legislation to improve the bargaining position of French farmers in commercial negotiations with distributors by the summer. He also promised measures to make it easier and cheaper for farmers to hire seasonal workers, including from abroad. Atoll also said that his government is working to protect French farmers against Ukraine imports of chicken, eggs, sugar and cereals. The Prime Minister remarked that solidarity with Ukraine is essential. However, it cannot be at the expense of French farmers. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, dozens of tractors were parked outside Greece's parliament. One banner in the rally said, without us, you don't eat. Some farmers also carried mock coffins and funeral garland as symbols of their plight. Greek farmers have spent weeks staging temporary blockades along highways and in small towns. They asked for similar demands as farmers elsewhere in Europe. This is while farmers in central Greece are still suffering from major floods that occurred last year. The Greek government sympathized with farmers. However, it claimed it could not fulfill all of their demands. The government just agreed to reduce electricity costs. Of course, protesters did not find it enough. They asked for tax-free fuel, debt forgiveness, measures against foreign competition, and speedy compensation for natural disaster damage. Farmers also criticized the substantial difference in shelf prices compared to what wholesalers pay them for their products. Manalise Leokakis, a farmer from the southern island of Greece, said that farmers pay more than three times as much for petrol as shipping companies. It's because of tax differences. He said, we can't be producing and selling our products for ridiculously low prices while the consumer buys them at extremely high prices. The rally ended peacefully on the same day. Some farmers stayed outside Parliament all night and left with their tractors on Wednesday. Our hearts go out to the hardworking farmers. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. We've also heard that many of our viewers don't get notifications of our videos anymore. So 
please follow us on Telegram, Gab, Getter, True Social, Twitter, and on Ganjing World for the latest updates. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page, and we will see you next time.